Good morning, everyone. I would like to start by acknowledging the traditional owners of the various lands on which we meet. Um, Hamish and I are going to be taking a tour of country that's Boon and Woi country. And we pay our respects to all elders past, present and emerging. I'd like also to acknowledge their, their continuing connection to country and the responsibility that we all have to act with the same regard for place. Now, my name's Jill Garner. I have the privilege of being Victoria's government architect, and I'm joined today by Hamish Lyon from NH Architecture. And we are going to take you on a tour of 18 very important public places on the river edge in Melbourne. It's called Designing Policy for People because what, it, what we're going to be talking about is, you know, the stories behind each of these places. What, um, you know, what, what was the era that they emerged from? What were the discussions that were taking place in the city? The impact they've had on our city and probably the lasting legacy of them. We're going to talk about when they were built, when the designer or the year, the the designers who were chosen to design and implement these. We're going to talk a little bit about who was involved in the projects, whether it was government, local government, state government, uh, a private individual encouraging these projects, etc. So um, it's going to be just a bit of a chat between Hamish and I, and we're going to look at 18 projects, and I hope you find it really enjoyable. So we might get started. So good morning from me. I, I am Hamish. Um, we're looking forward to the walk along the river. Obviously, we were thinking originally we were going to be doing this in live space, um, but given the current situation, we're, we're now digital. But I guess many of you are probably sitting comfortably at home in your warm house with a cup of tea. So whether or not that's a better solution than walking along the river. Um, but yeah, we look forward to doing, doing the tour today. So let's get started. We thought it was going to be pouring with rain and wind. So here are, here's the sites that we're going to visit one at a time and we'll be talking about each one. And we're starting right up there in the left hand side of the screen in Docklands. And we'll be winding our way through from here. So here's where we start. So project number one is M Pavilion number two, I call it, which is has been relocated from the Queen Victoria Gardens opposite the National Gallery. And this is the second M Pavilion. And for those who don't know about the M Pavilion pro program, it was brought to Melbourne originally in 2014 by the Naomi Milgram Foundation with support from both local and state government and business as well. And so each year, there's an architectural project which is designed for the Queen Victoria Gardens, as I say, opposite the National Gallery of Victoria. Each pavilion hosts talks, seminars, exhibitions, workshops. Um, they're gathering places and they're, they're there for public discourse. It's quite a remarkable program. And each year at the end of the season, the pavilion for that year is relocated. So Amanda's pavilion has been relocated into Docklands and Hamish, I don't know what you think, but it feels so comfortable in Docklands Park, this pavilion. Oh, look, I think the idea that these pavilions can be repurposed into other locations and they all have found various homes across Melbourne is a great thing. So it's not just a, a one, one sort of process. It really does find, find its new place. And I agree, this one, it was fantastic across the road from the, the National Gallery, but it's also found a great home down in Docklands. So, yeah, I think it's a it's a, a great piece of work. Um, and for those of you who might be able to travel in the future, um, I've had the fortune to meet and spend a lot of time with Amanda Levite. Uh, she's a remarkable architect. So if you're traveling in the future, I recommend going to her Victoria and Albert Courtyard Extension in London, because it really is a, a very fine piece of work. And, and it's a slight fun fact for her studio is when you visit her architectural studio in Islington, um, it's a shoes off policy. 
So everyone in the studio has to walk around with their shoes off. And when you're a visitor, you have to leave them sort of Japanese style at the front door. So it does mean the night before you do spend some time thinking about what socks you might be wearing. But yes, she's a internationally <laughs> internationally recognized and fantastic architect. So it's great to see this in its location now. It's a series of petals, fiberglass petals, and it's like it reflects the natural idea of a canopy of trees that you might gather under for conversation or discourse. And here we here it is in Docklands, and we're winding our way now from that pavilion to just down the road to the Missions for Seafarers, which is a um, fantastic little building. I say little, it probably wasn't little when it was built, but it's very little now. And it, I've got, we've got two dates up there because, in fact, it's been worked on a few times, this building. It was originally built in two stages. Um, uh, between 1916 and 1919 and it was designed the original architect was a residential architect whose name was Walter Butler and he was in fact um, dare I say a society architect and he was really most renowned for his Turak homes and there's a lot of his great great extensions actually to Victorian homes that he did in a very different style he was he was an arts and crafts architect, so he, he brought that to this. And so as a public building, it's got quite an unusual architectural language, really. It's, it, he talks about it being about mind, body and spirit. And you can almost see that embedded in, in the three sort of parts of it. It's got a little chapel in the Spanish mission style that you can see there. It has a residence and a caretaker's residence, which is very arts and crafts. And down, right down there in the, on the left hand, sorry, right hand side of the screen, there's a little um, dome, a domed gymnasium it was. And it, it I don't know where that comes from. <laughs> it's, it's kind of, I imagine that was reflective of the idea of, um, I don't know if that's the spirit side of it or the body side of it. The body, obviously, because it's a gym, but it's got that idea of reaching to the heavens that you see in some of the enlightenment work, which is might be about the spirit as well. It's a crazy building, really, it this is, one. It is uh, a crazy, crazy building. I acknowledge that. And and, and for, for personal disclosure, when I was a student, I knew someone who was a caretaker in the facility. So I did spend some time in there when it was still operating and they were still serving lunches and dinner. Um, it, it is a, an amazing building. And, I think, as you saw from the last shot, sometimes people don't notice it because it's now very close to a major road. So you can kind of drive by it and not appreciate it. So it's in a very interesting location along the river. Uh, and it's something you do have to somewhat take the time to sort of stop and ponder whether you're walking along the riverside or just driving past on the Flinders Street extension side. And it also now sits somewhat in the shadow of, you know, quite significant you know urban development that's occurred in the Docklands precinct but I agree with Jill it's a it's a curio of a building it's a very beautiful thing and it's something as I say you, you need to stop and take the time to properly appreciate. There's, it's, there it is dwarfed by Docklands and this is actually the view from the river and unfortunately I think the um, the extension of Flinders Street goes within about a meter of its front door so they're, they've kind of turned it around to the river. So its publicness, if it has that, is now on the river edge and it has quite a different feeling, if you like, which is, um, you know, it's one of those difficulties when one, when a city impinges so closely on something, it changes the ground conditions, changes the sort of public realm conditions associated with the building. So this one, um, it is occupied still every day, this building. It's still used for its original purpose, but it's very crammed in from its northern side and it's now got a little bit of space towards the south, which is a good thing. And I think the, um, the owners and operators of it have had to shift their thinking about how do we allow it to be entered from the south rather than the north. So they've had to, to rethink that. And then the next project we're going to head towards um, is, is kind of the what we start to see on the other side, the river side of the Mission to Seafarers. And, the, and there's a couple of bridges. 
So the first bridge that we're going to look at here is the web bridge, um, which is an extraordinarily beautiful piece of urban sculpture that does a lot of things. It's, a, it's not a car bridge, it's a pedestrian bridge. And this was the outcome of the City of Melbourne's push to revitalise Docklands, that whole district, and to get a bit of foot traffic, to get a bit of cycle traffic, and to introduce the concept of art and architecture as a kind of an integrated urban response. So this was a design competition, and um, there was an existing bridge down here called Web Bridge, and the, it, it was the Web Dock Rail Bridge. And this was um, a, a re completely reinvented idea. So it's a pedestrian and a cycle bridge, and it links the south bank of the river into, into Docklands. And it, um, it references, for those who pick this up, it references the traditional curry eel fishing traps and it's really curvaceous it's got this beautiful basket that uh, covers you and it has to navigate a very difficult change in level it has to allow i mean anything over the yarra has to allow uh rather flat boats <laughs> to go underneath them but they do have to allow for the traffic underneath but it has to traverse quite difficult um um, access requirements. So it it is universally designed and it's a pedestrian and cycle bridge as well. It's I haven't talked about the architects really. It was a collaboration between Denton Corker Marshall and the and the artist Robert Owen. And I think it's a great example of a, a collaborative response. And look, I think you'll see as we proceed on the a walk down the, the river, um, and I think Jill will talk about a few of the other bridges that are coming up. These are things that have occurred really in the last you know, 10, 15, 20 years in the life of Melbourne. The previously crossing the river was the domain of the car. Uh, and it was really heavy infrastructure that crossed the river and going back a little while, and we'll talk about it a bit more, is the river was also used pretty much for infrastructure. So these pedestrian bridges have become really important because they connect major precincts, Dockland, the South Wharf in this case, uh, and they allow people to traverse the river in a, you know, as Jill said, a very calm and friendly manner. You're not worried about getting the sound of traffic or running, being run over. You can really, you know, take your time. Um, and as well as, you know, being a very easy bridge to walk across. Yeah, it's a beautiful experience. So I think Melbourne has emerged in the last period of time that the river is now seen as being a public asset. It's no longer part of industry and logistics. It is actually... And as we, as we walk down the river, we'll talk about it a bit, that it's become a signature part of Melbourne's urban life. It's got a great story about its installation. It, ha it, has, it had to be uh, installed with the tide cycle of the Yarra and it had to be floated and, and kind of accommodate the changing levels of the river as it was put in. So um, it, it was a fascinating construction process that was done as well. Okay, well, let's step off the bridge and where are we heading next? So oh, bridge. next bridge. <laughs> <laughs> you know this one? This, this is the, um, the Seafarers Bridge, which obviously was, it was originally um, agreed that when the new convention centre, which is in the distance there, was to be provided, um, a bridge would form part of it. So it added another pedestrian link to, um, to this part of the river, even though it's very close to the web bridge. But this one actually goes right to that forecourt of the seafarers mission that we that we saw a minute ago, and so it um, it got its name changed to the Seaf seafarers bridge to acknowledge its closeness to the seafarers mission. Um, it was designed by Grimshaw, and um, it was I believe opened. You, Hamish, you probably know a little bit about this. Um, opened with the convention centre. It's, yeah, no, it was it was part of the yeah, uh, yeah. project which we'll talk about next and one of one of the projects I was heavily involved in. But interestingly enough, a lot of people make the comment that the web bridge which we've just seen is quite delicate and you know small in scale. And this is a very sort of you know wide, somewhat heavier bit of infrastructure. It's incredibly popular with pedestrians, but it's even more popular with cyclists. It's really significantly big on the cyclists' route. 
But I guess it's always those backstories behind the curtain that make a difference. This bridge was required to be one of Melbourne's emergency response bridges across the river so that fire trucks and emergency vehicles in the case of a road blockage could get across the river. So this bridge was engineered to carry three major fire trucks sitting on it at the same time. And so although it's very popular with pedestrians and with cyclists, as I say, there's always a story about people go, well, why is it so wide and why has it got so much space? And you go, well, there's a, a 50 year plan that this bridge is part of connecting the north and the south in the case of a major emergency. Yeah, so that central street is able to be accessed by motor vehicles. Correct. Yeah. I've also seen references to um, a Chinese junk in its design. I don't know whether that was um, a reference from Grimshaw or, ref or whether it's been, um, you know, given that, that uh, mantra from someone who has done a, <laughs> a review of it. <laughs> Didn't see who called it that. <laughs> Not sure so there that. it is. <laughs> there, I mean, this is a great slide because it shows us where we're headed. So there we have the Seafarers Bridge in the foreground and we're, um, we're, we're looking there towards the Convention Centre and we're looking to where we're going to head. And the other comment I would make from that slide, um, if we can just go back one. Too uh, late. Oh. No, you got it. Um, <laughs> is the basis that um, in the middle of the slide is what um, what used to be called the World Trade Center. And while we were working on the Convention Center, we had our project office there for a couple of years. And we worked out there was a lot of eagles and hawks and a large habitation of seagulls. And interestingly, we had someone come from National Parks to give us a bit of a talk. And you can see the curve in the river. Uh, and since um, settlement or indigenous times, this is the point in which the bird life would habitate because they could see up the west to the end and they could see east. So it was a point on the river bend where birds could actually see whether you were the, the being, being eaten or the eater. <laughs> this was a point on the river that was significant to the, uh, to the bird life because it was, yes, yeah, I say, it allowed, allowed long distance views up and down the river. So it's interesting what you learn, even as an architect, you're going, that's not something I would have you know, naturally thought of, but you, you're always learning new things. So yes, we're, we're heading up the river and in the very end of that slide, I think is where we're going to end up. Yeah, so we arrive now at the Con Melbourne Convention Centre. And this this is part of what we've got now of the Convention Centre. And I'll, I'll, Hamish, um, Hamish appears as a, as a part of some of these projects. What well, makes you a very good person to be talking about this on this tour with. And this is one that um, NH was involved with. And actually, the other good thing about this slide is it shows the Hollywood side, which is the other kind of remnant of the maritime heritage of this particular part of the river, which is just a, a great little agglomeration of interesting elements, if you like, in this particular part of Melbourne. So tell us a bit about the Convention Centre, Hamish. Uh, well, as it says, the date there is when it opened in 2009. But, um... NH Architecture, working with Woods Bagot and with the Plenary Group, who are part of the public-private partnership program that the state government uh, uses to build a number of its infrastructure projects. We travelled uh, around the world looking at other convention centres uh, and discovered they were all pretty much the same. They were black boxes where you would go in a door to another door, get into your auditorium, and you'd be asleep within the first five minutes. Uh, and we also discovered that they were the same whether you're in Barcelona or Seoul or Miami or Berlin. So we decided to try and make a building that was much more local uh, and much more open. So all the infrastructure for the projects in the middle and all the outside is glass. So when you go to the next slide, you'll see that um, in the main foyer, you can go into the auditorium on the left, but the rest of the foyer is looking out over the Yarra River. So you feel and in making public architecture in public space, the idea that people feel relaxed and feel legible in the space, they kind of know where they're going, that makes a big difference. Uh, and I think the other thing that contributed to the public conversation in this project was it was the first six star green star project of its type in the world. So suddenly Melbourne had become a major player in sustainability uh, and it is still visited quite regularly, currently not at the moment because of lockdown, but we still get three or four delegations from the around the world coming every year to visit the building because it's still 
is operating at the global best benchmark practice. So, um, you know, we're obviously proud of it, but I think it's contributed to people coming to whether it's a plenary session, whether it's a concert, whether it's a you know school speech night, feeling like the building is open and friendly. So here you see it in the in the broad context. Um, and it sort of wraps up this little section of the conversation. So in the bottom left, you can see the web bridge. And then up in the middle, you can see the seafarers bridge. And then you can see the whole complex um, in play. I the admit, I find that this site is a bit crammed. You know, it's there's a lot of building on this site. And it's such a challenge to put something with those enclosed uses on the edge of a riverbank. So. It's kind of an interesting architectural response. DCM, here we are at just down the river, a little more to the to the east, where they had exactly the same problem as you of how how do you put a, a program which is so internalized on the edge of such a, an important visual asset. And so what DCM did, um, theirs is not a glassed-in facade. They've actually put a colonnade right along the edge of the river there so that you can, the public space associated with the exhibition centre is external. So you can walk all the way down this colonnade to the convention centre to the west. And it is a challenge, I think, to build public in a place that, um, that you know, you've got to acknowledge you are in a public zone and and yet the function of the building is one that is almost a black box and closes up while um while it's in use so and they're challenging projects yeah and that's been its great attribute over its, its period but its versatility as a public building like it really can operate and it does operate on any given day in a huge range of you know outcomes so you can have um, the home show, you can have the boat show, you can have the craft show, dare I say they can have this expo. Um, but even during COVID, uh, it was opened up and used as a drive-in theatre. So you could actually drive your car into the hall and watch drive-in movies in your car in the space. So it really is an example of where public architecture is incredibly adaptable. Uh, and it's, it's not so much the architecture that's the significant thing, it's the fact that it can be used in so many different ways for so many different public functions and you get the public promenade running out the front so yeah no an amazing contribution to the city one of the um really fascinating things i find about the melbourne exhibition center was that i remember before it was built that there was a part i almost call it a ruin a remnant of what was previously going to go on this site which was the melbourne museum and this and during the, it was probably the early 90s, the Melbourne Museum started being built on this site and there was quite a lot of concrete on site. And the, um, you know, it, we talked about some, the idea of brave individuals um, or individuals with a very strong and powerful opinion about what should go ahead, <laughs> perhaps. And certainly at the time, Jeff Kennett stopped the museum on this site, which is actually an incredible thing to do, stopped it during construction and in effect what this dcm building is is kind of a renovation to that piece of the museum that was already built on this site and um which is quite extraordinary if you think about it i wonder if it would have looked different maybe not and it's probably fair to say for probably the, uh, the slightly older members of the people listening in if you get into a taxi and you're asked to go to the melbourne exhibition center they can often be a bit and you say, can you please take me to Jeff Shed? And they go, oh, right, got it. So it's one of those projects that is, a, is politically tied to a particular um, era in Victorian and Melbourne's history. And kind of an individual in a way as well. <laughs> and there, there it is looking at it from, actually from um, another pedestrian bridge that was a, an addition to to the street bridge that was put there, I think, but done by Peter Elliott that linked into that um, that whole convention centre, exhibition centre precinct. And uh, a busy piece of Melbourne, a busy piece that, that wasn't busy at the time, absolutely layered with public facilities, public access routes, um, 
probably not doesn't hurt it's got a bit of good shopping down the back i guess that pulls people through as well but the public projects that are the image on the river i think are really successful and have done an extraordinary um extraordinarily positive thing for the south bank of this river so from here i think we head to a little further down oh now we hit the casino <laughs> um which actually hamish can i i have to say can probably talk about this one too having been involved in it but one of the things i did want to say about the casino it's another building apart from the sort of philosophical position about the building and whether one should build this type of building a at all or b on the banks of our river one of the things i think is an interesting approach to this was the idea that that um the enclosed you know don't know where you are could be located anywhere um which is really what a casino is about trying to keep people inside 24 hours a day was sleeved right along the banks of the yarra with highly active um uses so that in the casino is sort of concealed behind um, shop fronts, restaurants, active uses, um, and an incredible promenade. And I think what is successful in urban terms, you know, as I say, stepping away from any philosophical position about a casino, is that idea that it it actually activated more than a kilometre, I would say, of the river riverbank. And, it in, and the way that it's broken down into small scale tenancies, you walk it, it makes this riverbank, which is really long, extremely walkable. You know, who would have thought you would walk one or two kilometres down the edge of the river without noticing? And it's really because there's a lot of interest along this, this facade. And it's a good, you know, it's a good way of, you know, approaching something that ultimately, because of the building type, was not going to do anything to this place. And it was also probably the, um, the tipping point where David Yenkin, who was a great contributor to policy in Melbourne, was starting to shift the idea of the Yarra River being utility industry. So back in, just before this was built, this site was occupied by the Mazda car yard and a bit further along by the Allen Sweets factory. So all of these areas were industrial. Um, so I agree with Jill, there's the philosophical and ethical quick question about casinos. But in terms of its front to the river and its public promenade, it's incredibly popular. Uh, and the idea that the river is now part of the public life of Melbourne and not just something that you deliver things to your factory. You know, in 1994, this was a, a major a major tipping point in that conversation. And um, as I say, I, I think that the promenade is its greatest attribute and what goes on behind is a, a, another question altogether. And I think that probably takes us to the next project, which is similar, like this extension. Oh, no, we're going to cross the, uh, cross the river. Oh, yeah. You're about to do Southbridge <laughs> Bridge, but I'll do the Queen's Bridge because you mentioned before about all the pedestrian bridges crossing um, the river and having worked on, as Jill said, a range of projects along the river. Um, and she referred to flat boats. Well, this is the determiner of the flat boat. So just as trucks have to get under bridges on highways and freeways to make sure they're safe, Queen's Bridge is in fact the determinant bridge along the river for the height of anything that can go along the river. Uh, and certainly when we were doing some work at the convention centre, we tried to move the Polywood side and we wanted to return it back to its uh, original place a bit further along the river. It was this bridge that us from doing anything so it's a it's an interesting bridge but i think jill's going to talk about the one just on the other side yeah this one is sandridge bridge and this one um was actually a former railway bridge that that um extended it's it's the one that goes at an incredible angle across it used to take the st kilda railway line um which i believe was the first passenger railway line in australia and it took it across the river down to St Kilda. And um, so this is actually the third bridge that was built on this. There was a timber bridge in between as well. And this current bridge was designed by the Victorian Railways, obviously. And it, it opened up for traffic in about 1888, I understand. And it was, it's steel. And it's, um, it's got, you know, it's like 
fantastic railway bridge. It's got blue stone buttresses and um, and and great steel girders, those sorts of things. And my, what I one of the stories I love about it, it was one of the first um, railway structures in Melbourne that used steel girders. And one of the engineers who happened to work on it happened to be a student at the time, and his name was John Monash, which is a fantastic piece of history. Um, in, in 1920, electrical masks were added and it, it basically was last used in 1987 when the Sandridge line was closed down and it, 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 we, we put a light rail in to take us down to St Kilda. So it stopped and part of it was demolished and part of it was kept. And the piece that was kept, which is the viaduct over Queensbridge, um, sorry, the, um, the viaduct over the river, was redeveloped in 2006 as a pedestrian bridge. So once again, it's pedestrian and cycle. And uh, City of Melbourne was involved in this and it commissioned a work of public art to be put on the top of the bridge. So the piece of art that is on the bridge is was commissioned, it's called The Travellers, and it uh, represents the different types of immigrants who traditionally arrived by train in Melbourne. Um, so it's a remnant, a little, it's a series of remnants. It's been celebrated by a contemporary sculpture that now goes, um, marches its way across the bridge. Um, just kind of a, a folly, I guess it's turned into. And I'm sure the original railway architects uh, weren't from an engineering point of view thinking about making sure it lined up on axes with the beautiful clock on Flinders Street Station. So there's a bit of a, um, fortunate legacy that the engineers, well, maybe they did, but you do get a beautiful vista of Flint Street Station at the end of the walk. Well, no, they, it, the station would have come up significantly after this. Bridge. Of course. Yeah. So I think um, maybe Sweet. good management from somebody else. <laughs> okay. So from here, we head down towards South Bank and we get the next little bridge that is um, the a bridge that has very recently just been won, won a, an enduring architecture award. It, it's a really heavily trafficked pedestrian bridge built in eight, 1989 by Melbourne architects Cox and Carmichael, quite a small practice, who um, I'm not sure how they got the commission. I, I'm not sure of the story behind it, but it um, it... it it's a parabolic curve. It's a very clever little piece of structure. Bounces a bit, I think, as you walk across it. My understanding is that more than 200, oh, sorry, more than 20,000 people a day between Flinders Street Station and South Bank now use this bridge, probably not during COVID, but um, certainly it, it just was one of the few, that one of the first places that pedestrians could kind of nick across and arrive at Flinders Street Station um, without having to, having to traverse a huge path around. It was renamed the Evan Walker Bridge by the City of Melbourne to recognise Professor Walker's role in South Bank. You talked a little bit about David Yankin and, and Professor Walker, Hamish, and I mentioned them in the introductory talk the other night as well instrumental political advocates for change in um, in Melbourne and instrumental in starting a series of projects along this river walk that one after another have just added another really important moment that are enjoyed by the public. Yeah, look, uh, I agree with all of that. And in fact, I was on the, um, on the jury that uh, gave it the Enduring Architecture Award a few years ago. And the criteria for that is a project that uh, is, you revisit it after more than 25 years. Uh, and when I put this one up to the jury, everyone went, oh, is it that old? And you go, well, it is, because it's one of those comfortable projects that's sort of been in Melbourne for quite a long time. And it's a great compliment that it's sort of, it's interesting you don't notice it, but you notice it, it just exists. And so when a project in a public space transcends sort of its recognition and you just sort of go, well, it's just always been there kind of thing, hasn't it? You know, just it's just, it's a great compliment when people can say, look, it's just kind of part of the city. 
Um, and so I think the reason we gave it the award was exactly that. It's something that is just, just, it's there. It's incredibly well used. People cross it all the time, as Jill says. Uh, and it's it's just now part of Melbourne. Um, so yeah, it's a great success and I'm sure it'll be there for another century to go. Beautiful contemporary design too. Could, could have been done yesterday, I think. Um, our, our next, where we head across this, well, not across, we're staying on the, um, oh, well, we, we look like we're staying on the north of the, of the bridge, but we're looking back there towards South Bank. And we just thought we'd take a little bit of time to talk about South Bank because um, while perhaps I'd have to say the architecture of South Bank potentially is um, when it was originally done was is perhaps not what I might think is the best architecture in the world, but as an urban design concept and as we say about the commencement of this extraordinary number of projects and in this idea that this could be an asset, this part of Melbourne, rather than just being the back end of the city, the, the kind of the back door of the city and um, the Yarra being a bit embarrassing, really, as far as most city rivers go. The vision that David Yenkin and Evan Walker had to say, you know, most of the cities and great cities in the world have got a promenade along the banks of their rivers. So we have to do it. And they, their political sway, their vision, their push with the right people, and then this probably a liaison with the private sector, I imagine, is probably partly behind this as well. Just that idea of planting, um, enhancing pavements, getting rid of cars because there were cars running along here and, as Hamish said, factories, which most of which were derelict by, this, uh, by the late 1980s, they were derelict. So as a proposition for going forward and you know, setting in motion all of those projects that we have already looked at in this part of the tour, um, an extraordinary piece of vision for Melbourne. There's the flat boats. I was going to say, that, uh, there's the flat boats in play. And I think the other thing that's important is there's big urban policy conversations and, you know, the whole of the South Bank rejuvenation over the last 30 years has been a major public policy conversation. But it also comes down to specifics. And Jill mentioned the tree set outs. So this part of the promenade became the template for the width of the promenade, the levels for the high level and the river level. Uh, and so everything that was done going down to Crown Casino and down to the Convention Centre and as we move up towards Arts Centre Melbourne and Hamer Hall and onto the sports, sports precinct, this little pilot project set six or seven kilometres of public promenade in play. Uh, and the consistency of that has been its great asset. So as you walk from the Web Bridge and the Convention Centre all the way down to Rod Laver Arena, you don't have to change too many levels. It is universally design access and it is seamless and you don't have to cross roads or cars. It's really an amazing piece of public policy now at the end of its 25 to 30 year life cycle. So I think we're moving on towards Hamer Hall. And um, there's two dates on this because there's, great stories attached to this particular project and I mean the very first probably important thing to say about this site is the um the fact that because it sat on the south bank of the river and you know you can imagine it was the the entry I guess into Melbourne it was a, a bit of a sewer this part of the river and it the whole art center national gallery and Hamer Hall site was occupied in about the 1880s by a circus. It was swampy, but the circus occupied this land. And um, then the, the a fire destroyed the buildings that were on the site in about 1953, I'm told, um, which is feels quite recent, really, <laughs> somehow. Um, so the circus having been in the circus buildings having been destroyed, it gave government the, the opportunity to renegotiate the lease that the circus operator had on this land. And government had been eyeing off a site, you know, where will we put a major cultural centre for Melbourne? And they'd been eyeing off the idea of a National Gallery 
um, a series of a, an idea of a um, an art center, a theater, those sorts of things. Perfect site had been occupied by this circus and a lease, so that the lease got changed and government took it over as um, oh, I think they bought it um, as, as something that they could progress with their own vision. So they just so government decided this was going to be the home of a cultural complex. And in 1955, um, the then the then premier, who was Henry Balti, said that we are going to put a new art centre on this site. And by 1968, we had the National Gallery of Victoria done by Sir Roy Grounds, who also visioned the rest of the precinct with um, the originally it was going to be one building with the um, theatres and the art centre embedded in the same um, building, but it was found the ground conditions just did not allow that to happen. So, it, so Ground's vision ended up being broken into two buildings, which uh, you can see the remnants, the remnants of two of them in here. I mean, I shouldn't say remnants, they're fully intact really, but they've been layered with contemporary reinterpretations of, of the, where they first started. So what we're looking at here, that the round building, which is known, it's called a brutalist building, probably just because it's very stripped, it's it's very um, geometric. So the round building is the original Hamer Hall that sits in behind. Um, the addition to Hamer Hall or the reinvention of Hamer Hall that was done by, by Ashton Raggett McDougall um, in the 2000s. So it's, it's been a, an absolutely busy, ongoing, occupied, important part of Melbourne's cultural scene, sitting here on the edge of the river. One of the things that was, I think ARM have done with this project is just broken the barrier between the river and Hamer Hall down. And the, that serpentine frontage that you see there um, has a little lift embedded in it to, to take people from the riverbank up to the promenade of Hamer Hall. But it's just shifted the patterns of use of this part of the site. And I think it's been an extraordinarily successful contemporary, slightly irreverent, I'd say, intervention, but incredibly successful extension to the original building. What's your feeling about this one, Hamish? Uh, yeah, well, I, I agree with all that. And I think it's interesting to think that now at the, uh, it's at the starting point of the next rejuvenation of the arts precinct, on the public record that the um, state government announced last year, the $1.4 billion to redo the whole of the arts precinct. And at the moment, there's some work being done for a competition for the National Gallery of Victoria Contemporary Gallery that's underway. Um, our practice is working currently on the the theatres, the White Spire building, doing some um, work to keep keep the building up to you know international best practice. So it's probably a conversation that if we came back in 10 years time, we could have a total conversation about, this is really the next big precinct in Melbourne that over the next 10 years is gonna find its new public. Each of the venues is currently a very public venue, but I think the idea is that the precinct starts to feel more pedestrian connected uh, and starts to engage with a more lively sort of sense of how the public they might not be going to the concert, they might not be going to the ballet, they might not be going to see art at the, at the National Gallery, but they should still feel like they're part of the public space of Melbourne. So yeah, I think that's an important, important conversation that's going to occur over the next 10 years. I think the future of this whole precinct will extend that kind of pedestrian um, sensitivity that, and the, the accessibility, I guess, that absolutely universal access yep. that comes right through this precinct will wind its way down towards Sturt Street as this precinct is redeveloped. It's a really exciting future project for Melbourne that will tie this whole area right into the edge of the river as well. One of the things I love about it, I, I um, took a tour and um, there's me. <laughs> Right, that's, that's with my, my me being tour guide. Down, one of the things I really like about this Hamer Hall contemporary intervention was the way that it unveiled this edge 
of the Prince's Bridge and put this pedestrian connection right down beside the bridge. So there I am, there's, there's Hamer Hall on the left and Prince's Bridge on the right. And just this little slot, or it's not little really, it's quite a, a, a grand staircase, a slice between those two incredibly hefty pieces of infrastructure that take you down to the river edge there. And I, I really like the way this staircase has you know, it's really done something for this part of linking St Kilda Road down to the river edge, to the pedestrian. All right, we've got to keep moving, otherwise we won't reach our destination. Okay. So um, we've got a little bit to say about, about Prince's Bridge because Prince's Bridge is, oh, it's got, actually it's got some great stories behind it. It's, it's like other bridges we've talked about, it was actually the third bridge on this site and it had to be... Um, constantly redone because the river was widened, um, there was so much traffic and then it had to be reinforced because we had trams going down St Kilda Road. So it's had a lot of work. There was a lot of argument about whether the main tram thoroughfare should be Swanston Street or Elizabeth Street, but it ended up being Swanston Street. And so this bridge had to support trams. It had to support a lot of traffic underneath it and it had to also support a lot of traffic on top of it. So um, here's a story you may or may not know, Hamish, you'll love this one, that one of that the designer for this bridge was an, was an architect, came to Melbourne from South Australia, from Adelaide, and his name was John Granger. And he, believe it or not, is actually Percy Granger's father. And he set himself up in Melbourne as an architect and continued to have a practice in Melbourne. But he also happened to have quite a famous uh, local musician son. <laughs> that was not news to me, so I'm glad I know that. So. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, so this 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 was actually the work done on this was done to coincide with the international exhibition that came to Melbourne. So that's why it's got that sort of industrial, great industrial flavour to it. And it was named Prince's Bridge after um, after the, the the current prince the Duke of whoever he was, Albert Prince of Wales, he was. <laughs> and so that's who, who it was actually named after. And there was all sorts of arguments about whether that should have an apostrophe in it or not an apostrophe, those sorts of silly things. It doesn't have one. <laughs> but it's a very beautiful bridge. And it's, um, you know, it's really, oh, it does a lot of work, this bridge. I think we're off to Fed Square now, are we? Um, we're heading, I think we're going to ha take a, yep. oh, we're going to look other side of Prince's Bridge. Here we are at Fed Square. Um, and, you know, Fed Square, I, I'm not too sure what to say about it other than it's been the most incredible addition to Melbourne. Really brave decision, I think, from government to pull down a couple of 1960s buildings that sat on this site. There was also a railway station on this site, the so Prince's Bridge Railway Station sat underneath it. And we actually, from this view, that we're looking right through the heritage vaults that go underneath um, the old Prince's Bridge Station. And Fed Square was built on a platform over the top of the railway yard. So I always like to remind people of that because there's a lot of criticism about there being no trees in Fed Square. And, it's really important to remind people that it's a bridge. <laughs> so you kind of can't plant trees on the bridge. There's trees next to it. Most people know the story of Fed Square. It was a result of a competition um, with a very eminent jury. Again, I think Jeff Kennett was the premier at the time of it opening. And to his credit, he went with it and, and supported it as a slightly unusual piece of architecture for Melbourne was the competition was won by Lab Architecture Studio, who went on, oh, relocated to Melbourne, went on to become Melbourne Architects, and um, it, you know, loved and hated this project really in equal measure. Um, last year or the year before it might have been, it went on to the Heritage Register as the first. Australian building of the 21st century to be listed on the Heritage Register. Yeah, no, look, I, I think the interesting thing about this was, as you said, when it was being built, my memory was it was on the front page of the Herald Sun, 
the big banner saying this is the most hated building in Melbourne. Um, so it's the level of vitriol that was thrown at it during its its period of construction was extremely high. Uh, but over the last you know 20 years, it's a case of it has settled into Melbourne with great love, uh, and it's very widely used. Whether it's a cultural event or people are in the main space watching the football or the soccer on the television, and it's a, an example of public policy and public architecture that just takes a little while to settle into a city. Um, and I suspect if they did a straw poll now, it would probably be up at the top of one of the most favourite buildings in Melbourne. So it's a case of really letting some big urban interventions take a little bit of time to find their comfortable space and for people to find their comfortable space um, in the city. So, yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a great contribution uh, to Melbourne and a great contribution to us on an international scale. It, it appears in every tourist brochure, you know, everywhere in the world. So, yeah, it's a great contribution and well done to the lab team. It's considered one of the five most important public places in the world, public squares in the world. Yeah, I can believe that. Yes. So we're well, going to... We're... Sorry, Hamish. Yeah, I was going to say, so I think we're going to another public space. <laughs> well, first of all, we're going to um, just peek across the river and have a look at across... Because the other side of Fed Square... This is a quirky little piece of Melbourne that I think the city should be incredibly proud of because one of the things that the Yarra River has continued to host is, um, is rowing. And um, having spent many a morning as a rowing mother <laughs> on the edges of the banks of the Yarra here, this little row of boat sheds that exists um, across the road from Fed Square is, a, again, a remnant of a history, but it's one that is an ongoing history and an ongoing activity that takes place in this particular part of Melbourne. You know, if you hit this part of the river at 5.30 in the morning, you'll see activity like you've never seen before. And it's quite extraordinary that we are one of the cities in the world that right in our city centre, we have this extraordinarily um, specialist, I suppose you could call it, um, form of recreation and sport that takes place on our doorstep. In particular, the, the one of the projects I thought we might just focus in on, and the next slide focuses in on the little building that's on the left-hand side, which is the Melbourne University boat shed. And I, this is worth talking about because it's um, it's an extension to an, to an existing building. And the, the original rowing club is the building on the, um, obviously, on the right-hand side, built in 1909. So a timber building, um, a very quirky little towered row here, uh, uh, part of the row of this. It's a really significant piece of Melbourne history there. It was designed by an architect called Eggleston, very famous architectural family, I think, in Melbourne, and I'm presuming it, it's a continued um, name from the same family. Um, it's historically significant for all sorts of reasons, as well as being a, a, a building of architectural significance. It's a difficult setting for an extension, and the extension here was done in 2012 by Lovell Chen. Their, their extension doesn't touch the original building. Um, it's and I, I like to talk about this as a really great example of how one extends a really sensitive piece of heritage because I think there's all sorts of things about this addition that um, recall the original except that it's a contemporary intervention. So this is a piece of a little tiny remnant on the um, a, a, a piece that's worth looking at in this walk along the edge of the riverbank. Then I think we go from into quite a complex piece of garden, which is Birrarung Ma. And so we've left Fed Square and we're walking east and we're walking across Birrarung Ma. And there's quite a few things hap are happening in Birrarung Ma, one of which is the Federation Bridge. So this is a bridge that was designed by Swanee Draper and it was Done, it was done in 2001, you can see there, for Federation, Melbourne's Federation. Um, and it, it was a coordinated and collaborative design between the architects, 
and between um, artists, Anton Hassel and Neil McLaughlin, and they team together to do, I, I think it's quite an extraordinarily beautiful gathering of pieces. It's a pedestrian bridge and a cycle bridge. Um, or am I wrong? It may not be a cycle bridge because, in fact, I heard that the um, I have heard that the the timbers on the bridge were set in a very particular way to discourage cyclists from using it. So I think cyclists are supposed to be on the edge of the river, not on this bridge. And it's linked to a a beautiful symphony that comes through the bridge, through the uh, the bells, the field of bells that sits adjacent to this. And there's a composer who um, who who did this kind of incredible composition that is rung by these bells. A lot of people don't even know that this exists. It kind of sits right in the middle of Birurangma and it's really worth a visit. Walk across the bridge and experience the Federation bells. Birurangma is there, we can see on the north side of the Yarra there, Birurangma is the small piece of green um, and the Federation Bridge is one of those lines that sits through the middle of that. And we're heading off towards the um, Olympic Park Tennis Centre and we are going to next, I think, hit the ten. Oh, Birurangma first. There's the Federation Bridge that you can see there, the Field of Bells, and a circus located in that particular part. So that is a, it's a garden where all sorts of um, public activities take place. So um, Birurangma, I don't know if you know much about it. Hamish, it was a, a an initiative of the designed by the City of Melbourne who called on Taylor Cullity Lethlian to plant it. Um, but it's a fabulous little piece of green in the middle of the city on the edge of the river. Yeah, no, that's right. It was a City of Melbourne initiative. Uh, and I think it's an interesting piece of urban space because over time, it's again a case where both public authorities and the public themselves take a little while to work out why they want to use it, what they want to use it for. You know, and over a period of time, it's become much more engaged in the city life of Melbourne. So, yeah, we can see Circus Oz there during Australian Open tennis. It's full of tennis activities. When the Moomba events are on, it's full of you know people participating in Moomba activities. So it's a bit like Federation Square. You sort of have to build some of these public domains, and they can take 10 or 20 years, everybody to find the right comfortable fit uh, as to how it's used. And so now it's no longer just a standalone facility. It really does connect Flinders Street Station, and I think we are about to cross the Tandaran Bridge, which means it goes straight into the heart of the Melbourne Olympic Park Sports Precinct. So it's become much more engaged in the life of Melbourne. Yeah, so, I mean, it was very blocked off from, and I think a bit of a dead end at that particular part of, um, of the edge of the north bank of the Yarra. So in 2016, um, government built this bridge, the Tandaran Bridge, which skirts you just close to the bottom of the Federation Bells Bridge picks you up, takes you over Batman Avenue and lands you across Batman Avenue in Melbourne Olympic Park. This bridge was, um, again, the result of a competition, a design-led answer, which is always quite an amazing thing to achieve, to actually choose a design rather than choose the um, cheapest price, <laughs> dare I say, although it, obviously it had to meet um, a certain budget. but. It was done by John Wardle Architects in um, collaboration with NADA from, um, from the US. And it's an incredibly poetic piece of almost landscape infrastructure. It sits so, despite how sturdy it is, it's like a, um, um, you know, <laughs> it's like a, a concrete kind of monster marching through the landscape there, but it's incredibly sensitive and interestingly scaled. It's wide because it now joins into Melbourne Olympic Park and has to carry hundreds and hundreds of people. And, and so the, the um, Australian Open now spills or activities 
at Melbourne Olympic Park now spill right over into Birurung Ma by opening this bridge and allowing um, pedestrians to not navigate the difficulty of crossing the road. They now scoot right up over the road and land at Birurung Ma. And so there's quite a good connection now between Birurung Ma and the Melbourne Olympic Park Tennis Centre. I think we now, sorry, Hamish. And in fact, the, the, the figures behind that is they have just short of 700,000 people visit the Australian Open every time the tennis is played. Uh, and after this bridge was built, uh, one third of patrons who now come to the precinct use this bridge. So it's, it's, it's success is measured in foot traffic. Um, so it's not just a sort of mythical thing, it's true. There are <clears throat> a whole new way of, a whole new system of movement that it's created. I think what it has introduced here is that is that system of movement that's encouraged people to come by train and walk. And they just start at Flinders Street Station and they land, basically land here at the um, Margaret, you basically arrive at Margaret Court Arena when you cross with the Tandaran Bridge. And this again is a, an NH project Although I, I did put an earlier date in there because this once again was a reinvention of a previous existing court that existed in this particular location. So, um, you know, sometimes we layer an existing facility with a new, a new life. And that is in a way what, what this particular project did. I'll hand it to you, Hamish, to tell us a little bit about, about the Margaret Court Arena. <laughs> oh, yes, you're correct. It was a, a, a rejuvenation of an existing outdoor court facility into a, a new arena. Um, and I think if we go to the next slide, um, its purpose was, of course, primarily to host the Australian Open, which is an international Grand Slam tennis event. Um, and doesn't doesn't just put Melbourne on the national scale, it puts it on the genuinely international scale. Uh, but one of the things that we were asked to do uh, for this project that makes it unique on a global benchmark is it has one of the fastest opening roofs in the world. So for those who like tennis, if you've been to Rod Laver Arena, it takes about 18 to 20 minutes to open or close the roof. We are asked in this case, given that there's a three minute change of ends in tennis, could we do it in three minutes? Uh, so we worked hard on the technology uh, and have to report, we did it in four minutes. Um, but it means that the play on court can continue without having to go off the court. So it was behind the scenes of the architecture, there's quite a lot of technology. But if we go back to the start of our tour and we talked about the convention centre uh, and the exhibition centre holding drive-in theatre, it goes to show how public infrastructure projects have to be versatile. So in fact, the opening night for the ballet this year, or the opening three nights on a Friday, Saturday and Sunday nights, were held in the Margaret Court Arena with the roof closed. So it was the host for the, for the ballet's opening night. So it shows that in public architecture now and public space, it's not one size fits all. It does have to be versatile. It does have to be dexterous. Uh, and I think that's a great thing. But these bits of public asset can be multi-purposed and really they can accommodate a whole series of things. And the other thing that this slide probably shows is Melbourne is inc it's just unbelievably fortunate to have these facilities, as Jewel just said, within walking distance of our major train stations. So just within this slide, you can see where we've come from. You can see Federation Square, the three stations just to the left. But to be able to go to the ballet, to go to the tennis, to go and see conventions, to go whatever it is, and you can literally walk there from the CBD by global standards, that is spectacular. Uh, and it makes the River Corridor really a, a jewel in Melbourne's it, 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 envious. We get international delegations, whether it's the Convention Centre or the Arts Centre precinct, or the sports centre precinct who are in awe of the fact that we have all these major public public places, public precincts within five minutes of the walking distance of the city. They just, it blows them out of the water. And I guess for Melburnians, we kind of get used to that. We sort of think it's normal. We have an arena of 100,000 people in the MCG there that you go, yeah, I'm just gonna walk there from the city. That, that is internationally amazing. Um, and so sometimes we do have to remind ourselves that the idea of public policy and public outcome, we should be proud of that outcome. Interestingly, this, um, <clears throat> this part of um, Melbourne was called Flinders Park right through till 1996 when it was renamed Melbourne Park. 
again by Jeff Kennett at the time. And um, the idea behind naming it Melbourne Park was that international thing to say this is, it, it was almost like an advertisement for the city to say we're, we are right in the centre of Melbourne here and, and it got that, um, that title embedded in internationally really in what was acknowledged as a particular um, incredible precinct right on the doorstep of a pretty amazing city actually. <laughs> Yes, and we've had, um, you know, being in the inner sanctum of the subject and the sports conversation, I know firsthand the feedback from, you know, famous international people like Serena Williams and Roger Federer and others, they are still incredibly impressed that they can get to their venues just down the road. They don't have to sit three hours in traffic to get out somewhere. And as I said, for all the, for all the places we visited today, you know, if we were doing this as an actual physical walk, we could have got from one end to the other in probably an hour. And to visit so many major public facilities in one city in one hour, as I say, on the on the world benchmark standard, that's that's extremely impressive. So Melbourne should be very um, very proud of itself. Um, and, and the River Walk is, you know, hopefully at some point we can do it in live space with the sunshine coming out. Do you know what? I suspect it might take us longer than an hour. <laughs> well, if we don't talk. If we don't talk. Um, so that is our last slide. That's where we've landed from west, from Docklands, from the M Pavilion, Amanda's, Amanda's M Pavilion, right through to Margaret Court Arena in Melbourne Olympic Park with a whole lot of little stops along the way and a bit of a discussion about some of them. So that is really the close of our tour. Anything that you'd like to add, Hamish? No, I thank everybody who, who came on our virtual tour. And if you probably want to go and have a second cup of tea, it's probably about the night time to do it now. Yeah, yeah, thank you so much, everyone, for joining yeah. us. Thank you very much.